Look, we all know what disturbing, disturbing things I feel about the starships in Star Trek. I just likes them, okay? And the most important thing is when we get to see them do something really, really cool. This is either my intervention or one of my favourite lists that I've done so far. Let's get straight into it. Here are the 10 greatest ship entrances in Star Trek. Kicking off this list at number 10 is the entrance of the Excelsior in Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country. Now, I'm not referring to the Excelsior from the beginning of the film, where the Praxis wave basically nobbles the poor thing. No, I'm referring to when it arrives at the Battle of Kittimer and the moments just beforehand. As of course you'll remember, over Kittimer, the Enterprise A is having seven shades of <clears throat> kicked out of it by Chang's cloaked bird of prey. The Excelsior is still in the Alpha Quadrant trying desperately to get to the Beta Quadrant in time. Captain Sulu is pushing this ship beyond its means. His helmsman turns around and says, she'll fly apart. Fly her apart then. Sorry, I love that and have loved that ever since. Thankfully, the ship does manage to get there in time to help the Enterprise by becoming a target. It is a great moment, not because I like seeing the Excelsior get shot, but because it takes the pressure off the Enterprise long enough for Spock and McCoy to do a little surgery on their torpedo, allowing it to home in on the bird of prey. Once that torpedo hits, well, both the Excelsior and the Enterprise fire everything they've got, creating one of the most replicated explosions in Star Trek history. Number nine, Klingon cleave ship, Battle of the Binary Stars. This ship actually has two great reveals in the first two seasons of Star Trek Discovery. I love its arrival in Such Sweet Sorrow Part 2, but very few scenes compare to just how awesome and kind of terrifying its reveal in Battle of the Binary Stars was. Just as things are looking their grimmest for the Shenzhou, the USS Europa arrives at the battle and saves the Shenzhou from impact with an asteroid. Admiral Brett Anderson is aboard the Europa, contacts Takuvma and says, let's bring an end to this fight. Mid hollow call, Brett starts to, to flicker and eventually the hollow kind of cuts out and we cut to an exterior shot of what looks like the front of the saucer section of the Europa beginning to implode? No, basically revealing itself to be a giant sword in space, the cleave ship decloaks, flying through the Europa, cutting it in half. It's only that the Europa self-destructs to try and cripple the cleave ship, which slows it down, but doesn't destroy it, that we get one of those, oh, the Klingons mean business moments in Discovery. Number eight, the Enterprise D, all good things. Now we ran a recent poll online and the Enterprise D of the future in all good things is a bit of a divisive ship because some people think it's absolutely brilliant and some people, I actually, honest to God, saw the word abomination. I mean, that's a bit harsh, but is it not a wonderful moment when the chips are down and it looks like the USS Pasteur is about to be boarded by the Klingons and Data announces the arrival of another ship? It's decloaking, so we're thinking, oh, it's the Klingons. No, it's the Enterprise. Admiral Riker has pulled the Enterprise out of mothballs. It has been refit with the addition of a cloaking device and a phaser cannon. It flies directly vertically, firing this phaser cannon, destroying one of the Nagvar class attack vessels and forcing the other one to retreat. For the longest time, of course, this was com completely just stuck in the all good things future. And with Star Trek Generations seeing the destruction of the Enterprise D, that thought, well, you know, that's the end of it. It's not gonna happen, Yaha! But Star Trek Picard's third season sees the Enterprise D recovered, given the star drive section of the Syracuse and plopped into the Fleet Museum. What's to say that maybe Admiral Riker in the future won't pull this ship out of mothballs, hmm? Number seven, Kronos One, Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country. Our second entry here from this film, because it, it goes to show you just how gorgeous 
this film actually looks. What's more is we get one of my favourite shots ever of a Klingon Katinga class battlecruiser. The last time we saw a Klingon battlecruiser was back in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan and even then it was stock footage reused from the motion picture. Throughout the decks of the Enterprise A it's announced that there is a Klingon battlecruiser arriving and we cut to a shot in space. Sliding in from the side of the screen, you see Kronos 1 and it's aligning itself to go at the same axis of the Enterprise A, which is a nice just little notice of the fact that in space, it's not like everyone's flying on, you know, the same level. So it comes in from the side, it writes itself, it flies toward the screen and we get a gorgeous strafing shot. We see again that it's got a lovely new paint job. Now this is because it's the flagship of the Klingon fleet carrying Chancellor Gorkon to Earth. There is a funny little moment. It's meant to come alongside the Enterprise A, but I think the helmsman was a bit like, well, we'll show you our bum. And they kind of go above it, don't they? Oh, I love that scene. It definitely says the Klingons are here and they mean business. Number six, Federation headquarters coming home. Okay, I was not expecting to see Federation headquarters itself warping through the Alpha Quadrant in an attempt to start the evacuation of Earth. I don't think anyone was expecting to see a space station move this way. The reveal of its arrival at Earth is... It's, it's kind of like seeing a needle or a javelin thrown through space. It arrives at the same time as the rest of the 32nd century fleet. We see, of course, the Neo-Constitution there as well. On its arrival, we see one of the segments already detaching because Federation HQ can effectively separate into several life rafts. Now, this is awesome for a couple of reasons. One, it looks brilliant. But two, it sort of builds on... The last time we saw a space station move this way was when Deep Space Nine was moved to the mouth of the Bajoran wormhole all the way back in Emissary. That was effectively just shifting it with thrusters, which is what we expect of a space station. Again, to mention Picard season three, we know that the original Earth space dock was moved from Earth to Athen Prime. So now I just really wanna see a scene of that big old mushroom flying through space. Number five, the Titan, no small parts. The season one finale of Star Trek Lower Decks gives us a lot in a short amount of time. We get the introduction to Peanut Hamper, one of my most hated characters in Star Trek at the moment. Sorry, Peanut Hamper, but look, it is what it is. You know what you did. Things are not looking good for the Cerritos at this point. There's pack-led clump ships literally pulling it apart. We've just lost Shax, who's just gone on his journey over the Dark Mountain, and we've got Rutherford with half his head pulled off as well. Captain Freeman is about to order the evacuation of the Cerritos when Boimler says there's another ship coming in, and we get for the first time, the reveal of the Luna class USS Titan on screen. Now, this was this was an incredible moment because this ship had been designed by Sean Tarango for the novel series of the Titan series. This was years ago. And for the longest time, we didn't think we were ever going to see it on screen. And then suddenly here it is realized in gorgeous animation. And you had... Jonathan Frakes and Marina Sirtis reprising the roles of Riker and Troy respectively. It was just so exciting. There was also, although we didn't know it at the time, a fantastically prescient joke in there. You had Boimler going, it's the Titan. You had the Packlets going, oh no, another Enterprise. Who knew? Eh? Who knew? Absolutely brilliant moment. And with the Next Generation theme playing over it, absolutely gorgeous. Number four, the USS Dauntless Crossroads. I've said it once, I'll say it again. If you're not watching Prodigy, you are sleeping on a brilliant show. This is an awesome reveal scene that we get in the second half of the first season. Up until now, we spent most of our time with the USS Protostar, which is actually quite a small ship. We didn't really get kind of how small. Yes, we see it landed on the ground, but when you're looking at it from the perspective of individual characters, it's still got a fairly decent size to it, right? Well, Admiral Janeway is aboard the USS Dauntless, which is a new Federation ship, which is based, of course, on the design of the Dauntless from the Voyager episode Hope and Fear. It's been updated 
and it's also big. There is a properly intimidating moment. Think of the shot, it's from behind the protostar and the Dauntless rises up in front of it and you think for a moment, oh, these kids are screwed. From Janeway's point of view, they've stolen the ship. That was the last known location of Captain Chakotay. And she's not very happy about that. And that moment, it is, it is intimidating, it is frightening. And if there's one wrong move, it really could have gone badly. That entrance was, mmm. Number three, the Titan A disengage. So the Titan A effectively is the Titan. Like there's a lot of reused parts from the Titan. So technically I've got the same ship on this list twice. Well, there is a moment in the second episode of Picard's third season, Disengage, that was one of those stand up and kind of punch the air moments. Aboard the SS Elios 12, you've got Riker, you've got Picard, and you've got Jack, who we will learn later on is Jack Crusher. And you've also got Frozen Beverly, and her life support is running out. The Shrike has them in a tractor beam. It does not look good. And they're actually talking about possibly surrendering to the Shrike at this point. Then Captain Shaw of the Titan A gives the order to warp right in between the two ships, which shatters that tractor beam, freeing the Elios and knocking the Shrike back a little bit. And it's also a gorgeous beauty shot of the underside of the Titan A. It, it is a proper Ooh! moment. We see a ship being thrown at another ship. That's just fun too. But that moment where the Titan A warps in, that was just, I, I don't know how else to put this then. It was cool. Number two, the Enterprise E First Contact. Star Trek First Contact, obviously directed by the wonderful Jonathan Frakes, does something very clever, which is it takes a lot of the big action and it puts it right up front. So we as an audience are like, oh my, the Battle of Sector 001 looks like it's starting to go quite badly for the Federation. Now, the Borg Cube has taken a lot of heavy damage, but with we're using the Defiant as our point of view ship, and the Defiant looks like it's nearly on its last legs. You've got Captain Worf. I'm calling him a captain because he's captain of the Defiant at this point, so I'm, I'm sticking with it. And of course, you've got helmsman Adam Scott. Worf is like, right. Perhaps today is a good day to die. Prepare for ramming speed. We have Adam Scott turning around and says, there's another starship coming in. It's the Enterprise. And then whoosh, the Sovereign Class Enterprise E enters the fray. And it is immense next to the Defiant. Think about it. We're watching this on the big screen. This was, I have to say the word, sexy. You know, then straight away, the Enterprise E, it beams the Defiant survivors aboard. It, you know, takes a couple of fire, but then thanks to Picard's knowledge of the board, it basically ends the battle pretty quickly after that. Not only was it just a great initial moment of, of entering the battle, but also like the, the Enterprise is here. Way, we're all good lads. Number one, Borg Cube, A in Arcadia Ego, part one. Now this might be a bit of a surprising number one entry on this list, but I absolutely stand by it because in the first series of Picard, which look, I understand that the first series of Picard, it had its issues, but the two great like shots of the Borg cube, the artifact are not among those issues. You know, I could have gone with maybe the scene from the end of episode one, which is one of my all time favorite scenes. But I think this one has more of a punch. Over the orbit of Coppelius, you've got La Serena engaged in a firefight with Norex Snakehead. And it's, they seem more or less evenly matched here. We have Rios is ordering, firing, ordering, firing. It's all, you know, it's kind of a dogfight. And then you have Rios going, how? Oh, that's unexpected. And then if you've got subwoofers, you would have been like me and your eardrums would have blown out as the Borg cube exits that transwarp corridor. Oh my God. Well, very rarely does a Borg cube arriving mean good things for everybody else here. So how's this gonna go? But it is just awesome. The scene that follows where it's taken down by some flowers, I'm not really sure, but that entrance nailed it. That's everything for this list. Now folks, 
as you know, we could do dozens of these lists. So let us know in the comments below what you would like to see on a sequel list to this. Everyone, you can catch us over on Twitter at Trek Culture. You can catch us on Instagram at Trek Culture YT. Catch myself at Sean Ferrick, And you can catch Tom at Tom C. Finn on Twitter as well. Yous are all awesome. Make sure that you live long and prosper. To our friends in Ukraine, Slavia, Ukraine, keep going. And everyone, treat each other with respect and kindness. The world is getting pretty bloody divisive at the moment, so let's just try as Trekkies to come together and show them a better way. Look after yourselves, everyone. Make it so.